We're in chapter 14. And <clears throat> this is the last part of this. So we will, uh, I have it down as 17 through 20, but there's also 21 through 24 after that, and then chapter 15. So go to uh, chapter 14, verse 17. <clears throat> And in this, uh, these few verses that we're going to read, we're going to introduce somebody you've never heard of before this time, if you are Abraham. His name is Melchizedek. Verse 17, and the king of Sodom, the king of Sodom. What a time. <laughs> okay, buddy, you'll forever be known by that. Not your name, just that you were the king of Sodom. Okay. You know, maybe you should have sought the Lord a little more. Okay, the king of Sodom went out to meet him. Who is him? Abram. Abram. And after his he came out to meet him after his return from the slaughter of Chedorlaomer. Okay, so uh, you remember Chedorlaomer, right? <clears throat> he was a great king. <clears throat> Excuse me. He ruled over many other kings who had kingdoms, um, and uh, when he went on this um, attack, um, he had many kings that were with him, who were confederate with him, and um, the king of Sodom, along with many other kings who s chose to rebel against Chedorlaomer, um, he came with his armies and all of his, as it were, mighty men. And he pretty easily, according to the way that it's written, pretty easily defeated and subjugated all of those who rebelled. Um, but then verse 17 and what we just read of it, which is not but about half of it, um, lends us to believe that Abram and his 318 men did more than just defeat Chedorlaomer. This says he slaughtered him. He slaughtered his armies, the slaughter of Chedorlaomer. I mean, wow. Wow. Okay, and I want to address that in just a little bit, or maybe I can now. I wrote some things on my way here. Um, I was thinking about <coughs> miracles, and you know that I've addressed this before in other places where um, we, we look at things as a miracle, and I'm not... I'm not saying that we shouldn't. I'm just saying that I was pondering that uh, because I've pondered it many times before. <clears throat> and the, many of the places where I see what we would call a miracle, I see, um, as in the case of Abram and his 318 guys compared to, I mean, Chedorlaomer almost had that many kings coming with him. You know, he was that, that big of a deal. <clears throat> um, it, was, it was overwhelming. And so I was thinking, okay, well, what is it that, that makes us call something a miracle? Well, one thing is, if it's supernatural, uh, then it's a miracle. <clears throat> um, also, we say that if uh, it's a miracle if, like the odds were just astronomical and there was really no way that you could win. <clears throat> Not that God did anything supernatural other than somehow make 318 men defeat all these kings. So that's a miracle. <clears throat> but I have noticed a pattern in the scriptures where a lot of times where we label it a miracle, what it is, it is the weakest, the lowest, the, the least God supports and turns the tide, like in this situation. Um, 
And, it, and uh, you know, you, you go through the New Testament, you, you read what Jesus said about, you know, uh, he that exalts itself is going to be brought down. And he that humbles himself will be brought up. And so, um, uh, and so many other things. You know, God has chosen the foolish things that confound the wise. And God has chosen the weak things. And God has chosen the things that are that set at naught and all that. <clears throat> And a miracle really, in a certain sense, doesn't require, if, if that's our mentality, it doesn't require anything on our part, any responsibility towards God. He just is going to, oh, he just did a miracle for us. But if, <clears throat> if what I'm addressing has any validity at all, um, then God's actually moving based on something that's happening in us. He's not just going, hey, Jesus, you know, angels, let's do a miracle. What do you say? It's been a while, you know, and let's impress everybody with this miracle. And they'll go, oh, he's the supreme being, except for he sent his son so that he could be the image of the invisible God. And that is that's everything from the incarnation, from him coming down and becoming a man and becoming all this and going through all that and then being seen in, in death on the cross and there showing not a miracle, but the power of God in weakness. Okay. So, I'm just saying, you know, and yes, it's true. I've never heard anyone else say this, so... Don't believe anything I say, especially when I say that. But <clears throat> I, um, I think that more times than not, the Lord is not just randomly doing something or just showing off that he's more powerful than bad guys. It doesn't sound like the one I know, honestly, you know. But rather it is him moved by... Uh, us being weaker or the least or, and, you know, I mean, and the disciples, the disciples are going, you know, we want, you know, we want to be the greatest of all. Let us sit by your right hand and by your left. And we're looking at all of that. We're, we're wanting, you know, an orientation that is up and greater and higher and fuller and more blessed. And, and Jesus said, you know, he that is least among you, he that is servant. Oh, what was that that Abram took to war here? Servants. I don't know. I'm just telling you. I think things, and I don't know if they're, you know, but, but the, the orientation of how I'm seeing the Lord, this fits in with that. Because the other has to do with greatness and power, and, you know, you know what I'm saying? It has, that seems to be the, the thing, and this seems to be him honoring, you know, he that exalts himself shall be brought down, and he that humbles himself shall be exalted. And and uh, <clears throat> and and so along that line, what if what if these things, what if these these miracles that we call miracles, what if they're actually uh, displaying traits of God to us? But because our orientation is the opposite, because we're wanting to be greater and bigger, bigger and stronger and faster and, you know, I just quoted the $6 million man thing. But anyway, um, we want that. <clears throat> um, and he's saying, get lower, get, you know, blessed of the meek. You know what I mean? Go through that. Go through his first sermon. It's the orientation is completely the opposite of that. I don't know. You tell me. We're going to vote, and if y'all all don't agree, then I'm leaving. Not really. I, I don't know why I said that. Okay. So, <laughs> uh, so here, let me let me just. I probably already said all this, but where where did we come up with miracle as always the explanation? See, I just said as always the explanation. In other words, maybe sometimes it's not, or maybe it's never. Um, <clears throat> First, it is either a supernatural act or something really outside of the norm. Second, it, it relieves us of any responsibility to be anything that would deserve it, at least in our minds. Lord, send me a miracle. 
not, Lord, I just want to be with you, whether by life or by death, like what Paul said in Philippians or whatever. Um, uh, or, or I just, I want to, I want to know you through this or, you know, you know, any, any of that, it's, I need a miracle. I just need a miracle. I just need a supernatural act and do it, you know, or this is not going to go well with me. Don't you care anything at all about me? You'll send a miracle. Okay. Now, on the other hand, <clears throat> There are those who stood in weakness, many examples of this throughout, particularly the Old Testament, who stood in weakness and cried out to the Lord, <clears throat> but it was out of their weakness, not out of their strength or out of their, their wanting strength, but they're standing for something. There's something going on in them. That's what I'm trying to say. There's something that God identifies and moves on. So that's just for pondering and and again, you don't even have to ponder it. So uh, let me make sure I've read all of this. Um, uh, but, if, but if it is true that God regards the weak and lowly, then I, um, if it's true that God regards the meek and the lowly and the lame and the halt, and remember those are the ones who gathered to him when he walked this earth. Do you remember that? The lame, the blind, the halt. That was a regular thing. The outcast. <clears throat> then if it's true and we don't have that spirit, and I'm trying to paint a picture of what if there's a person and this is true in God and a person doesn't have that spirit and they ask for a miracle and they don't get their miracle they could be angry at God because there's nothing right in them trying to be right in a sense with God. They're just looking for God to get them out of something. And then they could be very angry with God and blame God. Where were you? Why didn't you show up? Amen? Anyway. All right. <clears throat> um. I got this from the last sentence of my paragraph about uh, the slaughter because it was a slaughter and I was meditating on that and I went this we'd say that's a miracle God did a miracle but Mary the mother of Jesus when she found out she was going to bring forth Jesus says God has regarded the low of state of his handmaiden whoa whoa and you're going to get to be the one to bring forth Jesus that's good orientation there young lady <laughs> Amen. all right um, so in verse 17 we find that the king of Sodom along with the other other defeated kings came and met with Abram so okay so he wins he comes back and then uh, then a bunch of people show up. They want to see Abram. Who is it? It's not Chedilomer because he'd been defeated and whew, hightailed it out of there. Okay. <laughs> so who is it? It's the king of Sodom. Okay. Uh, along with the other defeated kings came and met with Abram. In verse 19, there was another king that came also. He was king of Salem. Okay. I'm not talking about in Massachusetts. Um, as it says in Hebrew, he's king of peace. Shalom. Salem. Salam. Arabic. It doesn't tell us if he and his people were among those who rebelled. Okay, so it's not telling us if Melchizedek, that's his name, it doesn't tell us if he's, he was among the kings who rebelled against Chedilomer and brought this grief down upon him. It doesn't tell us that. We don't know that. <clears throat> um, but only that he came at the same time as the other kings. His name was Melchizedek. He was not only a king, but was the priest of the Most High God. 
described as possessor of heaven and earth. Okay. Already got chills. <laughs> All over my body. <laughs> um, <clears throat> this, you know, uh, the, probably the best thing for me to do is just read this because I could never say it as well as the, that I was a scribe for the Holy Spirit. As we shall find in the next verse, all these kings came to be given something from Abram. Okay, right? They came and he says, give us the, well, don't I have that written up here? Um, no. But they said, give us, you know, give us, the king of Sodom said, just give us all of the <clears throat> people and da-da-da-da, and you can keep, you know, the stuff. And so they're coming, and they're coming to Abram, the one through whom God chose to deliver them in weakness and in being nondescript in the land. Compared to all these kings, Abram wasn't anything at this point. This is still early on. But... Now everybody knows his name, and all the kings want to come to him because they want something. They're not kings. Not if, you're, if it's all about getting something. The thing about being a king is, is that you're taking care of what's the Lord's, and well, look at David. What is the Lord's, and what is the people? At whatever cost to you, you that's what you're doing, you know, and we think a king is just a title and therefore all that goes with that. And that's not it in the eyes of the Lord. That is, that's, that's a correct orientation for Adam and the fallen nature. But that is not the way the Lord thinks. And that's why God said he has a heart after me, David. I've chosen him to be king because he has a heart after me. Okay. So these kings are coming and saying, you know, Give to me. Does that sound familiar? Anybody heard that before anywhere? Let's see. Prodigal son comes to the father and says, Give me the portion of goods that falleth to me. Give me what comes to me. Because it's all about me. And it's, you know, and I know I will live for God. You know, this is the way we go. I will live for God, but I'll do it better if you give me a bunch of stuff. Give me recognition. Give me, you know, money to do what I need to do. Give me, you know, all the things that in, in the regular mind of every human being we would think of. And David, even when they found him, when, they, when Samuel was sent to Jesse, his father, and they went through all those sons, when they found him, he was out there with his father's sheep, his father's sheep. And when he identified himself as that, he didn't say, I'm a shepherd, you know, and I'm a good one, you know, I ought to be king, you know. No, none of that, none of that. He was the keeper of his father's sheep because that's what his father asked him to do. And even though it was lowly compared to, look at, the, look at the first two. They were in the army that's standing outside where Goliath is walking up and down and says, give me a man that will fight me. Give me your valiant man and all this stuff. And the, the older brothers are going just well, like everybody else. Oh, this guy's really big. He's really big. He has a big spear because, you know, it, it it literally tells you all the sizes on that stuff. Dude, so you're supposed to be the brothers and go, you're supposed to see it and go, I don't think you are. Get me! You know, ah! And he came out, what, every hour, whatever it was, and just constantly, you know, tormented them. Is there not one among you? Okay, but they're still in the army of Saul and they're still big shots. And so the father does what with David? He'd had him take care of his sheep. 
Now he's going to have him take care of his sons. Go bring lunch to your sons. You know, go serve your brothers and go serve your father with what he wants you to do. So he gets there. And then Goliath shows up about the same time, you know, and he's ranting and raving. And David's looking at that, and he's going, uh, is, there gonna, is someone going to go out and, you know. Uh, Y'all hear this guy? He's pretty loud. <laughs> you know, anybody? Uh, so he says, hey, I'll, I'll go out. Saul gets all excited. The king, the king, the king, king, king of Sodom, king of Israel, Saul. He gets all excited. He takes David to his tent and tries on Saul's armor on a, I don't know, 16-year-old boy, I forget, you know, teenage boy. And David goes, I can't use this. This is not what I used. When the, when the bear came out, you know, I took care of him, and when the lion came out for the sheep, I took care of him. You, you don't just take care. If, you're, if you've got like a 30 aught six, you can stand a long way away with a scope, and that bear and lion can come out and go, ain't I something? But when you're a boy with a couple of rocks and a, you know, <laughs> you, know you better have God. <laughs> you know? But... But David's explanation of that but with the bear and the lion was, these were my father's sheep. And God's looking at that, that heart and he's going, that, that guy's a king at heart. Because he's not trying to be something. He's not learning or growing or, or, or working toward some place of honor or position or whatever. He's just being with the Lord. In the lowest, in that family, according to the way it seemed to be, in the lowest possible position. And he was the youngest. So, you know. <clears throat> so he goes out with his slingshot and his rock. And he says, you know. You uncircumcised Philistine, you are not the possessor that Abraham made us by offering up his son. So you don't have any right here. I'm bigger, I do too. No, no, no. There are things at work here that are greater than, than you know, a big sword and a big all this stuff and being a being a giant you you may be a giant in everybody else's sight but you're not in God's sight Amen. you know your orientation is all about being big and strong and mighty and all this stuff and mine is the Lord will take care of you with this rock right here All right, that's life and death, folks. That's life and death. <laughs> One miss and that guy's spear could be right through him, you know what I mean? That's life and death. We always see David and we see him so confident and everything. But the truth is, he knew he was facing life or death, but he, was, he had things in him from the Lord that assured, absolutely assured, he understood Abraham. He understood the battle that took place with Chedalom. He saw the slaughter and he understood what God can do with weakness and lack and emptiness even. Um, he learned the real lessons, not just the history lesson. He learned the lessons that Abraham learned. And he got the faith that Abraham had. And that is the faith of Abraham, by the way. So, so, <clears throat> um, 
As we shall find in the next verse, all these kings came to be given something from Abram, but not Melchizedek. Ah, see, there it is. He's a real king. Melchizedek came to give him something. Hmm, what could he give? What could he possibly add to this wonderful defeat of the enemy and, and of God's protection? It says that he brought two things, bread with wine, bread with wine, that's one, bread with wine. And he brought a blessing from God. Ooh, this blessing from God. Blessing from God. Hmm. As priest, he brought forth the tokens of sacrifice. Not in symbols or teaching, but in a form that can be partaken of. Communion. Communion. Broken. Poured out. This is my body that is given for you so that, I mean, Jesus said that at the Lord's Supper, at the Last Supper, but he's, but he's saying, he broke it and he gave it and he said, this is my body which is given for you. Well, what does that mean? So that you don't go to hell, so you don't, you don't have to suffer for all the things that you've done wrong, so that you are not separated from God, or all, all of that. Yes, all of that. But more than that. And usually in communion, that's where we focus. It's broken for you so that you don't go to hell, or your sins are forgiven, or this or that. And, but it's broken for you so that you can eat it. So that you can put this in you. Have y'all heard this before anywhere? Yeah. Okay. <clears throat> but this is it. This is what I want. Yes, it's for the remission of sins and da 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 da, but that's not all. And Paul really deals with it in Corinthians, man. He just won't have it that you just make it about that. You know, <clears throat> we are partakers of Christ. We are partakers, or we're not, or we're, we're just uh, Israel instead of the firstborn coming out of Egypt. We're just Israel that gets delivered by the blood poured out and taking care of sins and by his body broken on the cross, or we're, it's the firstborn within us, not us. We're not the firstborn, and no one is but him, but these are all images and shadows that we read about here. It's him, it's him, it's him. Um, he brings them, but they are sent from the Most High God. Melchizedek brought them, but Melchizedek is not the focus, folks. He's the priest of the Most High God, possessor of heaven and earth, and he's going to lay out this reality that is God. And he's not, he is not emphasizing Melchizedek. That would be a wrong orientation. He is emphasizing this God that he's priest to, to Abraham. Hallelujah. <clears throat> he brings them, but they are sent from the Most High God in order that Abram may eat priest food and the food that God fellowships in. This is, it's only priest food because it's the food God fellowships in. Do you understand? You can't focus on priest food being Melchizedek. You have to focus on the food that God eats that the priest got in line with and he's trying to help Abraham get there. The emphasis is the most high God, folks, possessor of heaven and earth. Okay. <clears throat> the great lesson this priest brings to Abram is that the very most high 
over gods and men, brings nothing of highness or great glory in which he wants men to take note, but rather one thing. He offers a meal, a feast, if you will. It is a feast of brokenness and that of being poured out. It represents his firstborn son's slaughter on a cross. He wants to fellowship with Abram over it. He uses it as first steps for getting this firstborn son formed in his servant, Abram. <clears throat> we still hadn't heard the fullness of this. But what we're seeing, what we're seeing here in the way that the Spirit of God was sharing it with me is that he has totally taken the focus off of Melchizedek and he's trying to see the God behind Melchizedek. Um, and yes, Hebrews emphasizes that this is the priesthood of Christ and, and this sort of thing. But there is still, a, if Jesus is a priest, there's a God behind that priest. There's one that sent Melchizedek there. There's one that, as we'll see, sent a blessing with his priest and sent bread and wine with his priest that is attempting to bring Abram onto another level because you know it takes it. You just, you know, on this stair step, you can't run and jump and skip steps. You got to take each step one at a time and Abram's ready for the next step. And then there'll be more and then there'll be more. But this one, this one will be so important to him. So important. In verse 19 and 20, God, God's priest Melchizedek gives forth two verbal blessings. Okay, right? Two, two blessings. Melchizedek gives forth two blessings. One to Abram and one to the Most High God. Do you see where the emphasis of Melchizedek is? <laughs> He's, he doesn't just come and go, I'm sent from him to bless you. He is so into his God that he delivers the blessing to Abram from the Most High God and then he blesses the Most High God. One thing after another after another. Moving self out of the way. Moving what we think is important out of the way. Finding source. Finding reality. Finding the Lord the way that he is and wants to be found instead of the way religious and religion has painted him to be. Blessed be Abram of the Most High God, possessor of heaven and earth. Blessed be Abram of the Most High God. Wait a minute. Wait a minute. What's going on here? Most High uh, possessor of heaven and earth, that sounds pretty much like wrong orientation, God. But it can't be, can it? It can't be a wrong orientation, not with our God, not with, not with Jesus, not with the Father. It can't be. We have to look deeper. We have to say, I don't get it. I don't see it. I don't grasp it. You're bringing bread and wine, so I see that. I see that if you're the Most High God, you choose the very least of things to bring in, and yet the greatest, they're the greatest. The cross was the greatest. The selflessness and the depth of that, the greatest and the highest, but it was the highest in lowliness. <laughs> That's your first clue that what is considered the highest really shows himself in lowliness. Bread and wine. Bread and wine. A feast. Let's have a feast. Does that sound familiar to anyone? Let's see. We can go to the prodigal son with the father and the son having that feast. We can go to the feast that God said to them in, in, when they were still in bondage in Egypt. Let my people go that they may come out unto me and we may have a feast. 
It is a feast of eat my flesh and drink my blood, not get my powers and, and, and change the world. The only way to change the world is by the crucified. That's the only thing that's had an effect. I mean, the others have helped or done this or that, but the, the crucified, Jesus, that's where the change started. That's where it was. Blessed be Abram of the Most High God, possessor of heaven and earth, and blessed be the Most High God, which hath delivered thine enemies in thine hand. Okay, here we go again. What? Okay, how do we, how do we grasp this in the light of, you know, most of these things you can't grasp except in the light of his face. You cannot. You will not. You will, you will get it when it's explained to you, but you won't see it. You won't. And you think maybe gathering, you know, nuggets along the way, you know, I got this nugget and I got that. We're not after nuggets from sermons, are we? We're after the the true meaning of the Most High God, possessor of heaven and earth. We're after God's explanation. Melchizedek's words are that the Most High God blesses him. Okay, again, he's not, his words are not, I'm blessing you. I'm the great priest that blesses you. Do you see how we could miss, there's nothing wrong with the book of Hebrews, but do you see how we could miss the meaning in the book of Hebrews totally focusing on the priest of the God and not have any thought so much about the God? I mean, I'm just telling you that it's always the hidden things. God's back there. He's in this story. He's there. He's there big. But all we see is Melchizedek come in and we go, oh, a priest. Instead of this guy serves with all his heart the God that he knows and that he came to bring to Abram. Melchizedek's words are that the Most High God blesses him. It does not say if this God blessed him because of his use of weakness to bring about victory. That God blesses Abraham because of his use of weakness to bring about victory? If God just wanted to generally bless him, just, you know, randomly wanted to bless him? Or if his priest is merely referring to the blessing of giving Abraham the victory over his enemies? Is he saying you're blessed because God gave you the victory over your enemies just in general? I think I wrote here, I, I prefer to believe that Melchizedek's excitement over his God's willingness to bless Abram is not due merely to him being willing to fight bad guys, but because his method and faith may be more akin to this God's ways and being. The presentation of communion further reinforces this view. He's coming to God. You know, the, the scripture says, God, the eyes of the Lord run to and fro over all the earth, seeking, you know, the one that, that he wants, seeking that which pleases him, seeking the thing that touches his heart. So here he is, <laughs> you know, all of a sudden, Melchizedek shows up, and he's a priest. And he comes with a blessing. Remember, I said two things, bread and wine and a blessing. Both of them, I believe, are the same substance. God's honoring weakness and is wanting to commune in man. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. I mean, he, come on. I mean, it's in the storyline, he could have, 
It could have been anywhere. I mean, this didn't have to happen, did it? We could have just seen a miracle and said, Drew, he's up there and he did it. That's what. I, that's my God. You know, <laughs> or we could meet him. We could have communion with him in weakness and brokenness and poured outness. And, and it could be, and Melchizedek's just the guy, he's like the servant at the table serving both of them and saying, you know, y'all have it, y'all have fun together. You know, the father and the prodigal when they're going, oh my God, you know, and dancing and making merry. Hallelujah. And excuse me for yelling, but oh my Lord. Hallelujah. The second blessing from Melchizedek was toward God himself. He doesn't bless Abram for the victory, but God. Again, it is almost as if Melchizedek sees how his God takes the side of the weak and the priest blesses him for being that way. He turns and goes, I bless you for this way that you are. You are, you are like the bread broken and the, the wine poured out. You are, you are of, of, a, of a spirit that is unlike all the kings that we just saw and all the war and all of the rebellion and all of the destruction. You, you come in weakness. And I bless you. Hallelujah. The final thing that happens in that, in that Abram gave him tithes of all. You remember that, right? Hebrews chapter 7 gives this account and uses it to uh, show the greatness over the priesthood of Melchizedek, over that of the Levitical priesthood priesthood among other things okay so he gives tithes all right but I want to and and maybe you notice I'm not trying to preach uh, Hebrew 7 you know I'm not trying to preach the areas where it talks about Melchizedek this is this is what the Holy Spirit showed me and he's showing me that even though there's that man Melchizedek there, the story itself is really very much sort of overshadowing him other than he's the instrument bearer. Here's this, and I bless you. He's kind of like in, in the middle of it. This is between y'all and y'all are feasting and everything, but I bless you, you know, for, for and weakness going away, and I bless you. And, and he's not so great after all. He's just excited. <laughs> so uh, reading verse 21 through 24 and if I get through this we will move on to chapter 15 when I get back from Ireland all right and the king of Sodom and said Sodom said unto Abram give me the persons and take the goods to thyself and Abram said to the king of Sodom I have lifted up mine hand unto the Lord, the Most High God, the possessor of heaven and earth. Okay, see, I got those chills again. Because it's not going to be what we suspected. It's not going to be the way that we think it. It's not going to be our orientation. He is now in tune with Melchizedek's God, not just Melchizedek. Verse 23, that I, that I will, because see, this continues as a comma there. The, I have lifted up my hand unto, unto the Lord, the Most High God, the possessor of heaven and earth, comma, that I will not take from a thread even to a shoe latchet, and that I will not take anything that is thine, lest thou shouldest say, I have made Abram rich. Save only that which the young men have eaten and the portion of the men which went with me, Aner, Eskol, and Mamre, let them take their portion. Oh, my goodness. He is, he, he, it's like he ate the bread and drank the, I mean, it really is. It's like he, he got it. He got it. He, he understood. What did he understand? 
he, he understood past Melchizedek into this God. So I wrote, the words, the king of Lot, um, sorry, he's the king of Sodom, but he's the king of Lot. Sorry, I, I shouldn't have wrote that there. The, the first words of the king of Sodom, of Lot, said to Abram was, give me. Again, I, I said this. Sound familiar? It's what the prodigal son said before the firstborn was revealed in him. Before the firstborn was revealed in him, we say, give me. We're like the king of Sodom. Amen? But then after the firstborn was revealed in him, he said, make me. That's when it began to change things. That's when there came another spirit in the whole thing. Um, God had to bring him to a place where he said, make me as one of thy hired servants. Remember, it was the hired servants that won the victory over the kings of the flesh. The kings of the flesh, your flesh. Come on, there's, this is, make it your story. Not just a Bible story that happened to him. Abram so response is that he now raises his hands to worship the Most High. What does that mean? Melchizedek introduced him to the one who possesses heaven and earth. Apparently, he does so by loss and weakness rather than by gain and strength. He, he is the possessor, but he got it by loss and weakness, not by gain, by gain and strength. That's how Jesus became Lord of all, folks. By death, by loss, by being treated like a reprobate instead of taking his God powers and just coming down and taking it over. understand or starting to understand possessor of heaven and earth. Um, <clears throat> Melchizedek introduced him to the one who possesses heaven and earth. Apparently he does so by loss and weakness rather than by gain and strength. Abram is ready to practice what he has learned. I will not take from a thread even to a shoe latchet and that I will not take anything that is thine. He's not going to take it by strength or, or others or da-da-da-da or all this stuff. Well, I, I don't deserve this because I, I won a battle. If at all, God will give me this because I chose weakness and I chose to be with him in that faith. So he's, he's changing here, you know. <clears throat> Last paragraph. Instead of gaining, he is losing or giving up to others what could be rightfully his. Does that sound familiar? What book? Philippians. Philippians. He made himself of no reputation. Jesus made himself. Oh, and we go, well, let's see. Yeah, okay, that's good. He was God for God's sake, he, and he became less and less and less until he was a carpenter's son. He didn't, he didn't say, well, I'll, I'll become greater than God and really, you know, impress him. You know, great. I'll, I'll keep my orientation going up so that I can convince them that I'm God. No, the possessor of heaven and earth got that through weakness. What could be rightfully his, what could be, should be rightfully his. Abram, all that should be rightfully his. <clears throat> and he says, I have lifted up my hand to the most high God, the one who serves communion, the one who puts weakness and brokenness into us so that we can overcome first our flesh and then the world. <clears throat> he, he, he looks at those things and he goes, you know, yeah, 
It's rightfully mine, and it's not rightfully yours, Mr. King of Sodom, because you lost it. So I have every right to take this. But he didn't just say, but no, you know, I want to bless you. He's not blessing the king of Sodom. He's making a stand for the most high God. And that's a, that's a different thing. I mean, we get compassionate ministry and we go, okay, here, you, you take this instead of, uh, look, I will not touch this if it does not come through weakness, if it does not come through death, if it does not come through loss, if it does not come through selfless giving, you know, then I don't want it. He'll take care of me. If he wants that, good, he'll do it. But I'm not going to glory in it when it comes, even if it, it comes as a result of lowliness. Take the lower seat, come up here. I don't really want to be up here. Most of y'all deserve being up here further, you know, on the, the higher seat, taking the higher seat. You, he says, come up here. And you go, I don't really want this. I'm not, this isn't where my heart is. I know some of you would love this better than me. I would really rather you take it. I'm only doing it for one reason. He asked me to come up here because he saw Jesus in me who gave himself and gives himself and, 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 honors loss and that sort of stuff. So I know I don't deserve up here. That's just him. But, Father, you're honoring your son, so I do this. And everybody goes, well, if you really don't want that seat, I really want it. I mean, I know it looks bad for me sitting over here. I'm third from the bottom. <laughs> you know. And the Lord said, no, you're lower than that. <clears throat> um, okay, so instead of gaining, he's losing or giving up to others what could be rightfully his. He wouldn't keep it because this God will now be his source and his means. This God. If he's going to be rich, then no one else will take the credit. And if, as in this case, he becomes a little poorer, it will be because this God has done that also. The only thing he claims is what can be given to bless servants. That's all he takes. That's all he takes. I give this to these guys. You know, I just want to bless the servants. You know. It's not, it's not, there's no pride in that. There is, there's a, a human soul being overwhelmed by the reality of the most high God is actually became the lowest, became broken and poured out. The only thing he claims is what can be given to blessed servants. After all, that's what this God does and did in this battle, he will now do the same in me. Amen, let's pray. Amen. Father, we thank you for this story, not because of Melchizedek. In fact, Father, we notice that he didn't get mentioned a whole lot, that you did, that your son did, that this reality of your nature, not, not you, you specifically or him or the Holy Spirit specifically, but God, the most high God, the way God works, the way they bless one another and don't declare themselves. And Father, it's, it's, this is the God we serve. This is, and, and Father Ab Abram, Abram, must have, it, this must have blown his mind because he realized that the God of Melchizedek was already the, his God, but he didn't know him in this way. Didn't really know him yet in this way. Not like this. Not like this is the way you are and this is the way you want me to be by feeding me this communion. Thank you for the stand he made. Yes, Father, he will pass on through many steps before he gets to the, the place that um, 
he fully understands the giving of the son, the firstborn. But Father, what a day this must have been for him because he saw that he wasn't the only one with this God. There was this priest, and this priest served this God. He genuinely served this God, and he served him up to Abram. Thank you. Let it not be just that story. No matter how much it might touch us at the moment, let us fight through until it is our story. Let us see that this very thing can happen to us, that we, we can make steps towards lowliness and everything and have the God of lowliness show up and say, let's fellowship over this. Let's see it as life, though, and not just actions of lowliness. Father, Father, breathe the story into us. And Father, Lord, if we have not seen this story as the light of, of how you gave it to me to share, then Father, may we have some conviction to say, I've read it over and over, and I, all I would see is what was written in Hebrews because it spelled it out there. But here you are above Melchizedek. You are the God, possessor of heaven and earth. That you, you're the most high because of your lowliness, because of your selflessness. So we ask you, we ask you, Come the way you did with Abram. And, and instead of bread and wine becoming symbols, which they weren't to Abram, they were realities of his God. May we not see it as, a, as symbols of our freedom from sin and just take it and, and then go about our lives selfishly or putting self first. but where we'll lift up our hand to the Most High God. And we will, we will be confronted immediately with opportunities to exalt ourselves, and we step back and say, I will not do this to the Most High God. Hmm. Father, we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Some of you may want to continue to pray or seek the Lord or whatever. Uh, feel free to do that. You are dismissed as the Spirit lets you go. And if you have places you have to go, feel free to go there.